Hi everyone, my name is Wawa Gathiru. I am a climate advocate and the founder of Black Girl Environmentalist, and welcome back to EDF's Climate Conversations Curated. Over the next few weeks, I'm getting together with EDF subject matter experts to demystify environmental work with down-to-earth conversations about climate solution pathways. This week, we're talking all about environmental justice, and I'm so excited to be able to introduce you both to um, our, our audience here today. We have Dr. Margot Brown and Vicki Patson, and we're gonna jump right in. So the first question I have is directed to uh, Dr. Brown. Um, so Dr. Brown, can you talk to us about the history of the environmental justice movement and how it was formed? That's a great question. First of all, thank you for having us today. Um, the environmental justice movement in the United States really got started in the early 80s. And it, there was one case in Warren, North Carolina, that really was the spark for the environmental justice movement. In 1982, there was a small, predominantly African-American community that was designated to host a hazardous waste landfill. And that landfill was supposed to accept PCB contaminated soil and it was a result of illegal dumping from toxic waste along roadways. And that was the real spark of the environmental justice movement in the United States. And then fast forward, a few years later, there was a report that was conducted entitled Toxic Waste and Race in the United States by Benjamin Chavis and Charles Lee. And that report found that the toxic siting of facilities in the United States was not in fact by accident. That siting was directly attributed to local, state, and federal zoning laws where waste was usually or mostly deposited in communities of color. In fact, race was the number one predictor of where hazardous landfills would be sited in the United States. And that was really the spark of the environmental justice movement. Thank you so much for that great introduction. I think what's so amazing about hearing about the environmental justice movement and Warren County and hearing that history is knowing that a lot of our elders for the environmental movement are alive today and are continuing to be a part of this fight to this day. Um, so Vicki, I'd like to um, ask you a question if that's all right. Um, so we've seen sweeping verdicts come about this past session from the Supreme Court on body autonomy, gun safety, and greenhouse gas emissions. Would it be all right if you talk to us about what the coal fire plant ruling means and how we can mobilize against the judicial overreach? Well, Wawa, well, well, it's just uh, really wonderful to be here with, with you and, and Dr. Brown. Thank you so much. and. You know, the words you use, judicial overreach, those are spot on because what the Supreme Court did in that, that ruling constraining EPA's authority to address climate pollution from existing power plants was judicial overreach. The, um, this is a situation where there were no national emission standards in force. There was nothing in effect on the books. EPA head, Administrator Michael Regan made it very, very clear to the Supreme Court that the Environmental Protection Agency under his leadership is going to take a fresh new look at all of these issues. And yet the court reached out, took the case, and then ruled in, in, a, in, a, in a decision where it, just, it should not have taken the case up in the first instance and constrained EPA's authority. And so it was judicial overreach. It did constrain EPA's authority to address climate pollution from existing power plants. Why does that matter? That matters because those are one of the single largest sources of harmful industrial pollution in communities across our country. It's also, they're also one of the single largest sources of climate destabilizing pollution in the world. So this matters and we need every tool in the toolbox to tackle the climate crisis and to advance justice. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Dr. Brown, I'd like to ask you a question now. Um, so if you could talk to us a little bit about EDF's newly established environmental justice principles and why big green organizations like EDF have such a crucial role to play in building equity through climate solutions, as a lot of critiques have come about in the past year on big green's lack of 
being able to do that in the past several decades? Well, I think uh, the big greens have learned from our past. And in the past, a lot of big greens, including EDF, had blind spots. And those blind spots included where and how to engage environmental justice and climate justice groups in developing environmental solutions. And what we've learned here at EDF is that we've got to do a couple things here. The first thing we've got to do is figure out how to remedy environmental harms that have been either purposefully or incidentally imposed on specific communities. And the second thing we've got to do is we've got to prevent those injustices from happening in the future. So how do we do that? One of the ways that we're doing that here at EDF is through our vision and principles. And those were developed last year and they are around three key areas. The first is sort of foundational, the second is process, and the third is accountability. So one of the things that EDF has to do first and foremost, and I would encourage every big green to do this, is we really have to integrate justice and equity into our work. And it's not because we are going to become justice and equity organizations, it is because in order to create durable solutions, it is imperative that we have those understandings built into how we do all of our work here at the EDF. And it's also really important that we honor diversity and the lived experiences of folks and communities. You know, I have a PhD and it took me about six years to get that degree. There are people who've been living with environmental injustices their entire lives. And it is so important that we honor their expertise here at EDF. It's also really important that we begin to become authentic partners with the communities and the places where we're working and that whatever solutions we develop, that they're not exacerbating inequity. And we're also reassessing ourselves over and over and over again. And I think if we can really ground ourselves as an organization into these vision, the, our vision and principles around justice and equity, we are going to be far more equipped to provide durable solutions to the climate crisis that are informed by people and communities with lived expertise. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. So Vicki, I'm going to turn it over to you as well. Um, so as EDF's general counsel, can you talk to us a little bit more about your work, um, particularly and the most memorable cases that you've worked on and what's next for your department? Thank you so much, Wawa. And, you know, there, there are no um, environmental problems that get solved by, by any one person, any one group. It takes all hands on deck to do it. And Really, you know, Wawa, one of the biggest changes in the legal landscape is, is the Inflation Reduction Act. And, and, and what that does in the legal landscape is, is, is really important because it's going to cut costs for essential, essential things like electricity and uh, prescription medications that will help save people money at, at a moment when every single dollar counts. It's going to make you know, billions of dollars of investments in clean solutions um, and, and, and invest in manufacturing and job creation. And there's a part of the Inflation Reduction Act that has received little attention that's also really important because it's a modernization of our nation's clean air laws. And that gives, you know, the Environmental Protection Agency leaders like Administrator Michael Regan reinforced, strengthened authority under our nation's clean air laws to establish protective pollution limits. And that kind of creates a virtuous cycle because if we're driving down the cost of clean solutions, um, you know, EPA can be more bold and protective um, in, in addressing the harmful pollution burden. There are also billions of dollars of investments in community grants and the language in the statute says they should be community led. There are billions of dollars of investments in clean solutions that are supposed to benefit communities. Investments in air quality sensors and frontline monitoring where we have serious and urgent challenges. 
all of this is important. It changes the legal landscape. It is just the beginning. It is not adequate. We have an enormous amount of work to do to address the climate crisis and to address justice with the urgency that it demands. This is an important step forward, and it's an important step forward that helps change the legal landscape in, in ways that you know we're all going to need to work together to translate those words on paper into real world protections for people and communities. Absolutely, absolutely. And so for our final question, I'd like to direct this actually to both of you. Um, so a lot of our um, viewers are always looking for ways to get involved, right? They hear from folks like you, they get inspired and they want to know what are some action items I can take away from this talk? So with that in mind, can you both give us some suggestions on how folks listening to this conversation can take action and how they can actually get connected with the work that you're doing? So I'm happy to take that question on first. Um, I always have the same two calls to action every time I'm asked this question. The first call is to educate yourself, to really learn about justice and equity, to learn about environmental justice and climate justice and social justice, because they're all tied together. And there's so much information out there to learn about how all of these things are connected. And so the first call to action is to read, read and learn. And the second call to action is to vote. And that call to action is not just to vote in a, you know, presidential election or for the senator, but it's to vote for every single election that you are eligible to vote in. A lot of times people do not understand that it is the local elections that impact your day-to-day -day life. It impacts citing decisions, and it is imperative that everyone be registered to vote and vote. You know, Vicki talked about the um, IRA, and we wouldn't be here as a country. You know, right now there's a lot of debate over the IRA. You know, there's some good things about it. There's some bad things about it. But we would not even be able to engage in this debate if folks had not shown up to vote. And so we have to encourage people to turn out and vote in every single election. Here, here. Um, and um, I would just add, in addition to, to Margot's um, just compelling vision and insights, um, we need to talk about climate crisis. We need to talk about environmental injustices um, and, and talking about them in a way that is it is having those difficult conversations, uh, reaching out, um, you know, is, is a really important part of this. And Wawa, your voice, your leadership, you're, you're having this conversation today and the many, many conversations that you lead all across our country, that's an important part of this change. Thank you so much. Well, it's been such a pleasure getting to speak to you all. And I'm so positive that the audience has learned so much from both of your perspectives. And I am personally really excited to continue to follow all the amazing things that you both do at EDF and beyond. And with that, I'd like to close conversation two and remind the audience that we'll be back next week to talk about zero emission vehicles with other special guests. So if you haven't seen all four curated conversations, do please take some time to watch the other installations. Become an EDF member and join the work being done at edf.org or join us on social media at Environmental Defense Fund. Um, whether it's clean energy economy, environmental justice, zero polluting vehicles or ecosystems, EDF and their over 800 staff members around the world are working to ensure a vital earth for everyone. See you at the next one.